Okay, All right, let's get started. So, uh, welcome to day two of the uh, workshop. Uh, a gentle introduction to hardcore programming. So today we're gonna slowly switch from the gentle part to the hardcore part. Okay. Um, anyway, so bef but before we actually um, jump into um, the actual content of today, let me uh, show you what Miro did. Uh, so Miro here is one of our participants. Um, he modify the uh, curve growth and sphere relax uh, or circle relaxation we did a little bit um, so that now it works on a nerve surface okay so that's the starting conditions um, wait where, where's the play button okay start again okay so it's working on the surface and after everything has like finished expanding um, you can make a little um, network, you can use these points as the basis to uh, put in the panels on the surface. And this is, so the sphere relaxation is like a one um, very um, uh, quick way um, to get a nice distribution of points and then because of that you can get a nice um, relatively uniform distribution of panels on a surface. Uh, especially when your surface is not a standard UV nerve surface with four um, defined edge, right? Uh, it's, it's not um, no kind of uh, UV grid paneling uh, method that can work directly on this kind of surface. Okay. So this the script that we did yesterday, um, even though we only ran it in 2D, it's actually already working in 3D because when we do the math, um, I mean all of the math we use upon 3D in vector 3D, so it's already work in 3D. It's just that the, the starting conditions are 2D and the Z is always zero, so they always stay zero. But if I, you know, um, draw a um, curve, okay, let's do a, 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 a curve that is not flat. Let's pick some point here. From this, I make an interpolate curve. And this will be my curve now. Okay, let's, let's make this curve non-flat. Okay. And fit this into the script. Okay, then remember, even though we visualize everything as a circle, but the code is actually treat everything as a sphere, you know. So it's already worked like as if we have sphere collision. Uh, so without changing any of the script, <laughs> if we run this thing, uh, should we have enough? Oh, okay, we have enough division points here. Uh, this time, maybe we should draw sphere and circle. Uh, but if you, uh, just a tip, if you want to draw sphere as a visualization, don't do this sphere object, do this mesh sphere, because mesh sphere is going to be um, draw and display much faster than the actual sphere. Okay. This in okay. Now, if I visualize that, let's see. Okay, so this thing already kind of expand in a uh, free space. Okay, of course, when you draw lighters in 3D, it's kind of hard to read the geometry. That's why yesterday I kind of kept everything in 2D because it's easier to, to see the effect. Okay. All right, and to make it work on a surface, uh, you know, we just need to one extra step in the code. So whenever we move the the center of the circle to a new position, we immediately, you know, um, project it or snap it to the nearest position it can find on the given surface. Okay. So anyway, um, so having seen that, uh, probably we can start on today. Uh, so this is the agenda for today. Um, so today we're gonna jump into Visual Studio. Um, we're gonna take some time to get used to it, um, and then we're gonna start to make very simple plugin for uh, Grasshopper using Visual Studio. I mean, um, there's gonna be quite a bit of you know, clicking, you know, copying, and setting up to make it work the first time. Okay, but then once you know the workflow, um, it should be fairly uh, straightforward to you know write the code, change it, and then see the effect in in Grasshopper. And then on the more uh, theoretical part, or just the poor C, C sharp uh, programming part, uh, we're gonna touch on object-oriented programming. Uh, some of you have already done that in Python, but now we're gonna do it in C sharp. And 
um, there's going to be many subtle points that uh, will be made, uh, especially this point is important so that you can understand the Rhino common documentation. And not just Rhino common documentation, but like many of the other APIs uh, or many of, our, many of the other programming libraries from other software uh, in our uh, uh, architectural and engineering and construction industry, uh, also based on object-oriented programming and based on the C-sharp uh, or the .NET uh, language. Okay, and then at the end, as a major programming exercise, we're gonna um, look into mesh, okay, um, mesh geometry, and we're gonna use a mesh um, as the basis to uh, implement this um, major exercise on the mesh growth by adaptive subdivision. So it's a 3D version of the curve growth that we uh, did yesterday, uh, but uh, this time we're gonna learn more techniques. So still essentially the same idea about like, sphere relaxation in 3D, and then you know, uh, as things grow larger, we split it and add more sphere, and then things keep uh, growing. But there will be like a uh, slight variation and like new techniques where you can learn in 3D. So, um, so let's fire up uh, Visual Studio, okay? Together with Rhino and Grasshopper. Okay, so Visual Studio is like a pretty um, comprehensive uh, suite of uh, software apps, um, tools, um, and it's also quite expensive. Um, the professionals is quite expensive, but you know um, there's a free, fully functional community uh, version with only the um, uh, features uh, as you can find in the professional. It's just that you are not uh, uh, legally allowed to use it for commercial uh, purpose. So um, let me, before I walk you into uh, the interface. Um, let me quickly describe what Visual Studio is. So Visual Studio is an integrated development environment. One way to think of it is it just a really, really supercharged um, code editor or text editor. You know, it's just, not, it's just not a simple window where you can type in text and press a play button. It has like so many other tools to make your coding experience uh, better, like make you, um, to help you organize code, especially when your code is really large, um, for example. And it has to, to test the code and debug the code as well. So it's more like a, just a simple text or code editor. Um, well, itself, um, Visual Studio is a software, obviously, but you know the, the reason why it is is that people use it to develop, you know, other software. You know, not just Grasshopper plugin, but um, uh, many other software like C plus, um, You know, and, and it supports many um, languages, uh, not just C sharp, um, but uh, C plus plus and Visual Basic. And since 2015, it also officially supports uh, RM Python. Uh, or both the standard version of Python, the, the C Python and RM Python, and um, if you if you download um, plugins or extension for Visual Studio, you can have support for many other languages as well. Okay, so we will be using Visual Studio as um, a platform or a tool to to make plugins to 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 write C sharp code that will be compiled to a plug uh, to plugins for for Grasshopper. Okay, so. Um, the best way to do this is via a live example. So let's make a, a, our first Grasshopper plugin. It's going to be a very simple plugin that doesn't do anything. It's just like a component appear on a canvas, um, on a ribbon, which, which you can drag and place on a canvas. Okay, you can customize the name, and um, uh, the name and which category where in the ribbon the um, the component appears. But at the first stage, it will not do anything. Okay, it's just sitting there in a the canvas. All right, so let's switch back to uh, Visual Studio. So let's go to new and choose project. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna create a new code or new um, code project, and there's so many um, templates to choose here, but we are focused on which one, on this one. So if you expand the Visual C Sharp category, and if you have installed the the Grasshopper plugin code template for Visual Studio, then you should see a category, a subcategory, a subcategory called Rhino Service. Okay. If you don't see it, then it means that you haven't installed that uh, the so-called uh, uh, Grasshopper um, code template. So you please go to the website and find a link to download it. Okay. Now. Uh, this thing says Grasshopper add-on for version six, so it's a code template to make plugin for Rhino six, but it's still 
work um, fine with uh, Rhino 5, I believe, because at least that's what I uh, noticed when I test this like uh, a couple of months ago. Uh -huh. All right, so we choose this template, all right? And now we need to declare a few additional informations. Now for those of you who are going to use Rhino 5, just to be sure, if you use Rhino 6, Keep the framework as .NET Framework 4.5. You know, I'm, I want to be able to explain what, what .NET Framework version means at this time, but for Rhino 6, it should be 4.5. But if you happen to use uh, ver, uh, Rhino 5, let's be safe and choose .NET Framework 4, okay? Just in case. Okay, so for um, the name of the project, I don't see the framework icon here. This one. Mm -hmm. oh, never mind. Which version of the user are you using? 2017? 2017. Okay. okay. 4.5 of Rhino 6 and 4.0 or just four for Rhino 5, okay? All right, now the name for this this entire project, um, we call it, let's, let's, for now, let's call it um, Workshop, okay? With uh, capital W, okay? So naming convention, the name of the project should always start with uppercase, and every time you have a new word, like, uh, so, or so, for example, like, my awesome workshop, then, you know, the M, the A, and the W uh, has to be um, capital. Okay. Now, we're going to choose a location where the work, where the entire um, folder, so, so when, we create pro when we create a project, it will be, we will have a master folder, and every file that relates to this project will be stored in that master folder. Now, we're going to choose where to store it. I will just put it on my own uh, desktop fo folder. Okay. All right, make sure. I recommend you put it somewhere that's not too deep in the uh, folder path, like otherwise uh, you might have a pro uh, problem browsing in and out late later on. Okay, and then make sure you tick this option, create directory for solutions. Okay, and now click, uh, let's click OK. And we're gonna see an extra dialog box happening, uh, well, uh, appearing. Now, here are some of the information that we need to declare so that um, the, uh, the Grasshopper wizard, uh, the Grasshopper code template wizard, will generate some of the basic code and file for us so we can start working on. Now, all of the information can be changed later. So if you like uh, accidentally enter the wrong name, um, you will still be able to change it later. So in fact, all of the text here, just keep it as default. We're gonna change it directly in the code, okay? Um, but this one, uh, if this wizard failed to recognize the right file, so in order to write code, uh, to write plugin for Grasshopper, the Visual Studio project we set up here has to see certain files, certain file that uh, that's the star in, in the Grasshopper and the Rhino uh, program files folder on your C drive, for example. Now, if the wizard failed to detect the path, uh, you will see a little red warning here. If you see, raise your hand if you have like some missing uh, reference. If you see like some red line here. Okay, so so okay, so we have to just manually browse through uh, this thing. Okay, if it's missing, so for for Rhino, usually it's in the C folder. So C program files and either Rhino 6 or Rhino 5. So for me, it's Rhino 5. Uh, for me, Rhino 6, and go to the system folder. Inside, you should see the rhino.exe, okay? So you browse it manually. So it's just a standard C program files folder for Rhino 6. Oh, oh, Rhino. Hmm? Which one are you browsing? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, same with Rhino Common, and um, Rhino Common is also in the system folder, but Grasshopper is slightly trickier because it's different from Rhino 6 and Rhino 5, okay? So on Rhino 6, the Grasshopper DOL file should be here. I will make the path a little bit larger. Okay, if you use Rhino 5, the path is going to be slightly different for, for the grasshopper.dol file. Raise your hand if you need my help and I will come. Okay. Yes? Okay. Okay, you browse it and then you have to bookmark it because you have to go on it again. So C, C program files, common files, MacNeil, Rhino 5.0. Okay, so it's pretty deep inside here. So you have to bookmark it. Hang on, I haven't pre finished yet, but I, I think you can now. Just but just just hang on, just in case oh, okay. uh, there's something. No. Okay, let me double check again to see if there's anything we can change. Now, um, since last year, all of these um, Rhino comment and Grasshopper file uh, is also available f from the um, online so-called kind of app store, you know, Visual Studio also had kind of app store where you can download all of these uh, packages. So rather than manually browse to your C drive, you can download it from this uh, online package. But I will show you, uh, um, I will show you how to use it uh, later. Okay, so let's get back to Visual Studio. We can press finish now, and then a new project with like a bunch of source code file gonna be created for us automatically. Okay, so now we are back into the, uh, no, so now we have a, a new project with some c -sharp source code file. Okay, so let me walk you through. So first, um, all of these files are physically stored on this location. So for me, when I create a new solution, I, I set the path to like, um, to desktop and then the workshop folder located on my desktop. So if I click on here, so every of the file that you see will be in here, okay? But you will not be modified this folder directly. So you're gonna add code, add new code file from Visual Studio, but like the physical file will actually appear here automatically, okay? And then let's say if you want to back up your source code file, you can like make a hard copy of this, of this entire folder, okay? Or you can, let's say share, wanna share the entire, you know, uh, source project, uh, source code project with your friend, you can just share the entire folder. Everything should be self-contained, okay? It's just that whenever your friend open it in their computer, and if the path to the DOL, to the grasshopper.dol and to the Rhino file is different from their computer, they just need to manually change it. Uh, but, but the source code file is, everything is contained within this master folder, okay? All right, so let's get back to Visual Studio. So on the right side, this is Solution Explorer, uh, this is called the Solution Explorer Windows. So here it will list the the light theme. Okay. Oh, there's an extra contrast here. Maybe this will help. But actually, that looks very ugly. I remember. So <laughs> let's do the light one. Okay. Take some time to change. 
Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, I haven't called in live theme for such a long time, actually. Uh, all right. The, on the right is the Solution Explorer. This is basically a little mini um, um, file browser. So this is pretty much the, the contents of the entire uh, workshop master folder that you see uh, in on, on just my desktop. But here you can browse it uh, inside Visual Studio, essentially. Okay. And then on the left hand side, this is kind of the main workspace. So this will show you the current file that's being opened. Okay. So here, two files are being opened. Uh, Workshop.info, okay, so the workshop info here, okay, and it's being opened here. Now you don't need this file, so please close it to avoid confusion. So the workshop info.cs, .cs is the, um, the, is the um, file extension for C sharp, not CS stands for C sharp, okay. Basically, it's just a text file, so you can open .cs file in Microsoft Word or any text editor even uh, if you want, but of course, we're not going to uh, write C sharp code in Microsoft Word, <laughs> so. Uh, okay, this is the main source code file that we will be working on. So this code is where we're going to write our C# -sharp code that that represent our, our custom plugin component. Okay, so this code, uh, so this uh, file will be compiled to well, not just this file, but this file will give us a custom component that will appear on the ribbons of the Grasshopper canvas. Okay, so this entire project. So let's look at the. Um, the structure of the uh, source code. Okay, so at the first time you see it, it's quite scary, right? Because normally you just open a what you you're so used to programming or coding or scripting is that you open a, an empty text code and uh, an empty text file. You write in some line, press the play button, and see things start moving. And here, like you haven't even start typing anything, and you see a bunch of stuff appear out of nowhere, and it looks like um, like um, really daunting at first. Okay, but uh, eventually it will make sense. So don't worry. So if, let's look at the structure so, uh, of, the, of, of, of the folder. So at the highest uh, level, okay, this is solution workshop. Basically, it's called, they call it solution, but it's actually just the uh, folder, the, the, the outermost folder. Now inside the solution, there is one project, a C-sharp project. Well, it just happened to be the same name workshop. So Visual Studio, the outermost container, is always called a solution. Inside solution, we can have more than one project, but most of the time, this our solution contain only one project, so it seems kind of redundant to have you know solution and project. It feels like to be the same thing, but in a large uh, kind of uh, software development project, a Visual Studio solution can contain multiple projects. Each project can be written even in different uh, languages. Okay, but for now we have one solution. Each solution contain only one project. Okay. Any question? Uh, you, you were having a question, right? Uh, yeah, one is maybe oh. Okay, you have to do it again. You, you chose the wrong uh, template. Okay, now inside the workshop folder, there is a bunch of other files, okay? Um, again, we are only interested in this one for now, workshop component. The, the other one, um, you don't have to touch them yet, okay? So, So let me explain the structure of this file, what we can modify, and we can um, hopefully within the next 10 minutes, we're gonna see a basic components appear, uh, a, a, a plugin component appear inside uh, Grasshopper. Okay, so, so the file that uh, we're currently seeing now, if you remove all of the commands, uh, you know, uh, these are um, the, the, the command that like tell you what to do, but you can save the re um, re remove that and the code still run, okay? So, if you, you don't have to remove, you don't want to, but I just want to make it cleaner. Okay, if you remove that, then the structure will essentially be as, will be as follow, okay? So, there is a bunch of using statement uh, at the beginning of the file, just ignore them for now. Okay, and then there is something called a namespace with uh, a pair of curly brackets, and all the codes will go inside the namespace. Don't worry about what a namespace means at the moment. Just think of it as um, just a little um, code that like pack, uh, that wrapped around my uh, our main body of code. Okay. Okay, now inside um, inside the file there is so called public class, uh, my first graphical component. Um, well, we actually never name it my graphical component. I think it's just called workshop component in your file, but it doesn't matter. We can change the name a bit later. Okay. 
So inside this class, again, we um, we haven't really talked about what the class is, but inside this class, there is five places where you're gonna write the code. Okay, but most of the time, we only need to touch on you know four out of five places. So the first is this um, so-called constructor here with the base, base keyword. Here you can customize the name of your um, of your components and where they appear. Um, this functions can register input parameters with an now and uh, for now the, the, the this function contain empty curly bracket. Okay, we're gonna write some code in there. That is where we define the input parts or the input parameters to our custom component. The next one is where we define the output. Okay. And the most importantly, the self instance. This is where the actual computation logic taking place. Okay, so this one's for input, this one for output, but this one is the one where the input is actually being read in and some logic gonna apply to the input to transform them to an output and then finally sending out to the output part of the grasshopper component. Okay. So uh, we, we, we're gonna slowly add uh, the code in here, but let's look at the, the first one for now. Okay, so I will change the name of the class and the constructor of the class to uh, my first grasshopper component. Okay, so my so my first grasshopper component. Okay, And we use capital casing here, so M, F, G, and C are owned uh, capital. Okay, so um, these are some strings, just C sharp string or text that we can customize. So these will be interpreted as the name of our custom component, and this is the short name. Okay, so Grasshopper has two modes of displaying name, like the full name and the short name. This is a little description that you know you can write in, so uh, the the user of our component or plugin can kind of know the functionality mm -hmm. of this one. Okay, so let me explain uh, probably with some example. So if you look at an existing, uh, let's get over. So if you look at this first part here, we have five pieces of text, right? So um, if you look at an existing component that's already come with Grasshopper, let's say the construct point, okay? So the name, so the first few of the construct point would be called something like construct point, okay? The nickname would just be PT, okay? The description would be this, uh, like, English um, uh, piece of text here. The category is where you can specify where the components appear. So for the construct point, um, this entry here, this value here, is a vector. That's why when we... That's why this component is will be showed or displayed under the vector tab or the vector category of the main uh, grasshopper ribbon interface. And the subcategory, the subcategory is just basically this uh, little sub panel within within the category. Okay, so we can have one for ourselves. So let's call this this thing uh, with your name. So long's first grasshopper component. Okay, so when you install into grasshopper, that is the name of it. Uh, the nickname gonna be um, long's uh, first GHC or grasshopper component. Okay. The description gonna be hey, this is my awesome first grasshopper plugin component ever. Okay, or anything you want, okay? Now the category, um, let's put it under the workshop category, okay? Um, so from now on, any components that we create for this workshop, let's group it under this category called workshop so that it doesn't uh, you know, uh, appear all over the place. And the subcategory, I really don't have a good subcategory name for it, so I will just use the word mix dot. So remember, we have five entries in total. You should define all of them. If you have to give a string. If you don't want to define, give an empty string. If you don't give it enough string, it will complain. Okay. Nice. 
mist is just a subcategory name and I don't have any good name for it so I just give it mist which means miscellaneous oh. okay as long as you put it in the workshop categories to make things organized then it, it should be fine oh. okay all right um, that's it our components like uh, useless now it's not doing anything <laughs> but it's a fully functional component which means that we can like build this source code into a GHA file into an actual plugin file where we can install into our main Grasshopper or Rhino program. Okay, let's build this. So let's go to the build tab and say build solutions, okay? Or control shift B for the shortcut if you want to. Okay, and um, if the build is successful, you should see it say that uh, one succeed. It should like uh, on your screen everything should be black here. But I have a, a little plugin for um, for Visual Studio to color the message so that they easier to read. But on your case, they should be only black. Uh, so it say one succeeded. Okay, so which means that the source code has been successfully built. Okay, and the product, the outcome is actually a physical file. Now where is that file? Now the file is stored in a, the, the, the output folder inside the workshop master folder, okay? So if you physically go to Windows Explorer or whatever, or the desktop here, okay? If you go to your, your master folder, okay? And inside there is this workshop folder, okay? If you go to the workshop, you will see a folder called bin. So bin, by default, bin is the, the location where all of the build product will be placed into. Okay, so if you go to bin, this is the outcome, uh, workshop.gha. And that is the plugin that we can install to Grasshopper. Okay? So let's install that by drag and drop to the Grasshopper canvas. Or um, you guys know how to install the GHA file? Uh, have you ever done this before? Okay, so. So the, it's actually slightly different from Rhino 5 and 6. Um, well, this step is not different, but the next step will be. Okay, so. So installing a, um, a GHA file or a plugin file to Grasshopper is just a matter of placing that file in the right folder, okay? So we're gonna go to this folder, so go to Grasshopper. File, special folder, and component folder. Okay, it will open the uh, the special folder here, where all of the other plugins. So th th this folder usually already consider a lot of other GHA file from other plugins like Kangaroo or whatever. We're gonna place our GHA file in here. Now we're gonna at some point we're gonna need to access this folder quite frequently. So I recommend you to bookmark this one. So on Windows 10, you just can simply drag and put it in, in your quick access, um, in your quick access um, uh, category or whatever. So you can later like uh, get to that very very quickly. I already have, I already bookmarked it here, so I can quickly go here. Okay, let's move your GHA file there. Okay, so whenever you have when you whenever you install a plugin this way, even though you already place it in the right folder, the plugin will only be loaded the next time you start Rhino and Grasshopper. So if your Rhino is already open, you have to close it and open it now. It's kind of annoying, but I will show you a shortcut later. But for now, just close Rhino and open it again. Okay, and then start Grasshopper.
And if you do everything correctly, then magically, you will see a new category up here called. Oh, well, that's not the right time. Uh, you should see a new category called workshop, and if you click on that, there should be a new subcategory called miss. It's called long first class of a component, which you can drag and place on the canvas. Okay, so raise your hand if you have not achieved this first step. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go back to Visual Studio. So um, now we're going to add more functionality to the plugin. Um, except that you might notice it's very annoying that whenever we add a new feature to the code, we have to build it, get a JSA file, install it to you know, move it to the right folder, and then restart Rhino. So it's kind of annoying every time you make a small change, you want to see how the change affects your, you know, uh, the, the way your plugin works. You have to do so many steps just to, like, to test out. So we can automate um, this a little bit so that um, you don't have to like do too many like mouse clicking and uh, uh, and restarting of, of Rhino. Now the, uh, and the workflow is going to be slightly different in Rhino 5 compared to Rhino 6. Okay. So first, now by default, the um, the build output, which is the GHA file, by default it is stored inside the master folder. Of, um, uh, of our entire uh, Visual Studio solution, but we can change the output path so that it basically output the GHDF file directly to the libraries. Now, we're not going to quite do so. We're not, we don't want to change the output path because we want to keep inside the Visual Studio solution, you know, but we want to automatically ask Visual Studio to copy, do it. So rather than like, doing a mouse clicking, uh, it's possible on Windows to write a, sh a small uh, script. And so if you go to properties of the, um, if you double click on properties, Okay, and go to build event. Okay, in build event, you're gonna see these some com uh, some commands here. These are like Windows PowerShell commands. This 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 is not C sharp code. These are just like a command uh, that you use to automate uh, copying uh, file and creating folder inside a Windows operating system. Now, if you guys happen to use Mac, I honestly don't know how it works. So, <laughs> um, but you, you can try it out because the syntax on, on Mac is on a Mac file system is different. But anyway, so so what does this thing does so far is it just renamed the output. So so by default, when you have a C sharp project and you build it, the product that you get is workshop dot the DLL, not dot GHA. But for Grasshopper to load to recognize the file and to load it correctly, the extension has to be .gha. So what does this uh, script does is it automatically rename the DLL file to the .gha, just renaming so that it will work with Grasshopper. Now these commands here was was put in here automatically when we set up the project. You know when we set uh, this little wizard set up on the code template, it also put this extra code in here, and basically it's renamed the file. Uh, from DOL to GHA, and it's out, but it's like output the new GHA file in the very same folder, the same output folder. So if we can change the path here, okay. So let me do this in another text editor so it's larger uh, to see. Okay, so these are the commands, right? So let's replace the path to the to the folder where we. Um, uh, where where the grasshopper plugins is normally located. So file special folder components, okay, and copy this path, okay. It's different from each computer because it has your username on it, so it's not the same for everyone. Copy the whole thing, okay, and paste, okay. So replace, put it here, okay, between the um, the quotation. Okay, so that's the path and the file name gonna be. So after the path, you have to slash backward slash, 
on Mac, um, on Mac maybe it's forward slash. I, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, and um, the name of the plugin, which is workshop dot gha. Okay, so that is where the location that the gha should be copied to after it has been successfully built every time. Yeah, you, you can do copy twice. Just. If you want to keep the original file, you can just place it in. Uh, okay, so this is not necessary, but just optional. Okay, so I will I, I will not do it here. Okay, so whenever now whenever you build and if the build is successful, the file will be copied. And if you look at the output, like the, the build report panel at the bottom of Visual Studio, it will say one file um, like one file copied. Okay. Uh, just a word of notice because this path is dependent on the username. So if you move the entire source code to another computer, you have to go in and manually change it. Otherwise, the copy will fail, and then you will have a the way it reported that the project failed. But it's failed to the copy, not failed to build. So, but like it may give you the wrong impression that the code like has a bug or an error, and then you got panic, even though it just failed because the path is different. <laughs> the path happened at the last step, actually. Anyway, so uh, later on today, I will share you some of the workshop where we will start work working on right. And whenever you, um, it's actually already in the hands that you download. We will be working from the like half build solutions. Whenever you open it later, we will have to go in and change the path before we start working. Okay. All right. So uh, you will see that as um, you know, uh, um, tool developer, you will have to work with like five half and five system a lot um, anyway. So it's time to get used to this uh, as well. Okay, so that's one thing. So now we don't have to copy at all. The file will be placed correctly in the right folder, but we still have to do this annoying step of restart Rhino every time, because even if the file is being copied, that new file will not be loaded until Rhino until Rhino is like reload uh, itself. Now we can avoid that. But the way to do this is different from Rhino 6 and Rhino 5, okay? So I will show you the Rhino 6 um, way first, okay? But, okay, well now, there's one step we need to do um, in both Rhino 6 and Rhino 5. So let's go to the Grasshopper Developer setting. Grasshopper Developer settings. Make sure this option is on, okay? If it's already on, fine, just close the window. If in your computer, if it is off, you have to turn this on, okay? Press OK and restart Rhino at least once for that, you know, on to be really uh, taking effect, okay? I, 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 I want to be able to explain what that option does, but it requires for this workflow um, um, to work, okay? So make sure it's on. If it's already on, fine. Yeah, it, it has to be on, it has to be checked, okay? S on some computers, might be off. Okay, all right. Um, now, this is how you um, like update a new GHA or update a plugin in, in in Rhino 6. Okay, so let's say that you um, currently you have a GHA. It's being used right here. Your GHA five comes component. Okay. Now um, you go to Visual Studio. You build it. The GHA has been updated, but the one that you see in Grasshopper is still basically the old uh, GHA. Okay, the new one, even though it's in the right folder, it hasn't been like loaded back here yet. Okay, so the way we do it in Rhino six, okay, is first we have to close all of the Grasshopper file. Okay, okay, in Rhino six, there's no way to fully clo close close Grasshopper. Grasshopper still run in the background even if you uh, close this uh, windows. Okay, so what you do is just close all the file in Rhino six, and then you type in this uh, super secret uh, command that will not even appear in the autocomplete. Okay. And this command will basically force Grasshopper to reload all of the GHA file. Okay, so the command is follow: Grasshopper reload assemblies. And as I say, it will not be show up in the autocomplete because it is a hidden command. Okay. 
Grasshopper reload assemblies with capital G, capital R, and capital A. Okay. Assemblies, plural. Assemble. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> And if you type that command, uh, you will see the grasshopper will attempt to reload all of the GHA file, not just in the, 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 our plugin, but also all the kangaroo and everything else will also be reloaded. Okay, um, anybody need, need help? If you should see that this kind of report from Grasshopper that these plugins have been reloaded and the workshop, uh, not GHA, uh, our, like the, our, our workshop which is called um, workshop, I mean our plugin which is called workshop should also be reported as being successfully reloaded here. So workshop, successfully reloaded. Yeah. Grasshopper, okay, reload. And assemblies uh, as plural, so um, let me type it. Yeah, yeah, hang on. Grasshopper reload assemblies. Uh, okay, now if you are. Um, Okay, uh, if you are really lazy like me and you don't want to type out Grasshopper Reload Assemblies every time, you can buy this command into a, a, a shortcut, okay? So, um, in, you can buy any command into a shortcut actually. So, let's go to Tools and uh, Options, okay? Tool option and go to the Keyboard category. Keyboard, okay? Okay, the Rhino 5 people just wait uh, a minute and I will show you um, the equivalent step later on. Okay, so let's select a key that you find convenient for you. So I uh, actually bind the reload assembly commands to control R. Okay, but you can bind to anything you want. Just don't bind it to any dangerous, uh, close to, to any dangerous key like F. Or F5 or the delete button, for example. Um, so, so if you browse with your favorite key, um, you can just type in that command grasshopper reload assemblies, as I did here, and press OK. And from that time, you um, you can execute that command by just press that uh, key combinations. Okay. Okay, so that's for Rhino 6. That's how you um, reload, uh, force the plug into reload. First, you have to close all of the currently open Grasshopper script. Okay, so here I close everything. Grasshopper is open, but it, there's no open file. Okay, and then um, you call Grasshopper reload assemblies, and assembly will be reload. Okay, now for the Rhino 5 people, um, this is what you're gonna do. So in Rhino 5, you basically, um, you don't force the GHA to reload. In Rhino 5, you just restart Grasshopper entirely, and you do it by two commands. The first one is called Grasshopper Unload Assemblies, uh, sorry, Grasshopper Unload Plugin, and the second command is just Grasshopper to, to start it again. Okay, now we're gonna buy it into the shortcuts too, so you don't have to type in the commands all the time. So for Rhino 5 people, go to Tune, Options, um, Keyboard, Okay, and choose a convenient key. Um, I think I will do Control R as well. Okay, so Control R, you type in two commands. So two, two commands separate by space. And the first command is 
um, so the first command is grasshopper unload plugin space followed by the grasshopper command okay and this will effectively restart uh, grasshopper without helping you to close the rhino fully In Rhino 5, if I press Control R, you will see the grasshopper will you know start from scratch, and if you press Control R again, uh, it will close and then open up immediately from scratch. And this will effectively force all of the uh, GHA5 to be uh, reload again. Okay. All right. So now with this workflow set up, we can go and change the code, build it. Go back to Grasshopper and reload the assemblies. Okay, we don't have to like copy and paste the file with our mouse anymore. So that's good. All right, let's go back to Visual Studio. Okay, let's, co uh, uh, let's close the properties window. So we open it to edit the path, but we can now close it. Okay, let's get back to our main uh, C-sharp source code for our component. Let's say that we want to change uh, something here and we want to you know, reload this new change in uh, Grasshopper. So I would say, um, I would change the name of the component to you know where my name gonna be capital instead of lowercase, right? And okay, now I can quickly test this change by first build it, okay? The file will be built successfully and it will be automatically copied to the right folder. And I just need to go back to Grasshopper. Make sure, for Rhino 6, again, make sure you close on the opening file and just press Control R or your special short key to reload the uh, GHA file again. Okay, and now if I place the component, uh, my name should be Capital now. Uh, workshop. Wait, it's still low, okay, really? And in the uh, same with Rhino 5, you just reload the entire uh, grasshopper and you just see the chains being reflect. Hang on. Build. Why is this? Um, you can change the name in the description to anything you like. Just, just make a change so that we can see it. Uh, so we can see it. Okay. Uh, for me, it doesn't. The yeah, but when I hover the mouse over to get a full name, it still doesn't look correct. Did it change for you? Oh, okay. Hmm. That's weird. Yeah, you can. Uh, but I also, in my case, I look at the full name and it still doesn't um, sh show the change. Uh, yes, by default. So you have to hover the mouse over it to see the full name. Yeah. Huh? Okay, so you, you make a change to your component, like let's change the name to something else and rebuild the code, okay? Rebuild and then the file should be copied. So you okay, and you can verify that the file has been copied by looking at the timestamp. So you should see the time to be very recent, like ten. Oh, this is like really old, so it was not copied. Yeah. Oh, if you replace the file, it's definitely will work. But um, this copy should work automatically. So properties, hang on. Oh, because I haven't changed the path on my computer yet, silly me. I did it in the um, text editor here, but I never copied it back to Visual Studio. Okay, silly me, but... 
Anyway, let me help out these guys first. <laughs> It always happens every year. Now, you see, we have 50 people, so <laughs> you can imagine. So. Okay. Um, let me fix my quickly, and then we can carry on to actually do a real um, useful, even though it's not a um, very spectacular uh, plugin. Um, okay, so okay, now in our project we have uh, one source code file, okay, and uh, this one will give us that component called you know uh, my first component or whatever. Now, a plugin can have more than one component, right? So let's add another component, and, and, and that second component will be another file that has the same structure, but with different name and different like code for the body, okay? So let's create another file, but you know, uh, there's, there's already a template generator that basically generates this kind of similar structure. So let's close this one to avoid confusion. Close this one, okay? Now right click on the workshop project, not the solution workshop, but the workshop project, okay? Right click and say add new item, okay? This is where we're gonna add a new C sharp source code file to this project, okay? Now there are many templates to choose from. Of course, the most default one is just a blank template, which is basically just a blank text file or a blank source code file. Uh, but we're gonna choose the Grasshopper template. So go to the Rhino series, okay? And as you see, the template is called an empty grasshopper component, okay? All right, but don't click OK yet. Don't click Add yet. Just select it. Now, the name of this file, okay? So the file will be located inside the uh, same folder, uh, for sure, but the name. Now, by conventions, the um, name of the source code file should match the name of the class. Now, again, we haven't talked about the class uh, yet, but we're going to name this class um, this class gonna basically uh, compute the average of two numbers. So we call it GHC average. So GHC is actually just my own standard convention. You don't have to follow this. GHC means grasshopper component. So I name all of my class that, that represent a grasshopper component as GSC. No, because there will be other class you will see later on that does not directly represent the component. It's just class to represent pyramid or flocking simulation or, or MF growth system. Those are not the crossable component, so there will be no prefix. Okay, so I will say GXC, where, where G is capital, and then average, where A is capital. So that's his name of the source code file. And then we can click add. All right, now we're gonna, of course, customize the name and the category, and we're gonna declare the input port, which is basically two numbers. The output port gonna be one number, and the actual compute average is gonna be right in self instant, okay? So, of course, this is very simple. In the C-sharp component, you just like, take two, compo two number, add together, and divide by two. Here, uh, we recreate the functionality just to see you how the setup works. Of course, the actual part that compute the average will just be essentially one line of C-sharp code. But in order to get it work, there will be so many steps. They declare the input and the output, okay? So when you make a plugin, there are a lot of so-called boilerplate code. So boilerplate is like the one that, the extra whistle and bell to make it work, okay? So um, a component that computes the average of two numbers, okay? So in the constructor, in the base, okay, let's customize the name of our components, okay? You can give it any name you want, but please put it in the category called workshop so they are grouped together nicely in one category, okay? All right, so let me do that with you. So, again, I will just write this in five different lines so it's easier to read. It's going to be workshop, subcategory going to be utilities.
Okay, let's quickly build this and go to Grasshopper and reload. And the reload might not work in Rhino 6. Um, in this case, I will explain why, but just let me test out whether it works or not. Oh, actually, it doesn't work. Okay, now let me re put it back in. Build and reload. Okay, uh, it actually works. So if you build and reload, you should see a new component and a new category appear here called utilities because I, I named the subcategory utilities. And if you drag it to the um, to the canvas, you you, you see uh, the component called average right here. And again, it's uh, completely useless now. It doesn't have any input or output. Okay, uh, any problem? No. Okay, so this is the second time we kind of do this workflow, so you should be able to get used to it, like change, build, and reload, okay, and, and test, okay? All right, now let's get back to the code. Um, I'm gonna close this file um, so, that the next, so, so that I can reload it easily next time. Close this. All right. <coughs> Go to Visual Studio. Um, okay, now we have to declare the input and output part. So the input's gonna go in the register input parameters. Okay, and here is how we're gonna save that. Okay, so um, the, the register input parameters, uh, it will take in one parameter called pmanager here. Now, remember when we define functions, it will take in the parameters, and then the, the, the function we use that parameter to like do something meaningful. Now, in this case, I feel a bit weird because this function is kind of already almost declared a header. For, uh, the header has been declared for us, and and when Grasshopper actually run these functions, it will pass in the pmanager, and we, as the developer of this plugin, we just take the pmanager to um, um, uh, and use it in our code. We don't have to worry where this pmanager will came from, okay? Because we we would we are not a person who actually going to invoke this function. We just define how it works, okay? So we're gonna use pmanager and pmanager dot add number parameters, okay? So this will basically say that I want to add a new input part, our component. This this function add number parameter will take in four parameters. The first one is a piece of string, uh, a piece of text or a string uh, variable, a string uh, piece of data that um, tell you the name, the full name of the input part. This is the short name. Usually um, short name is just like one letter. Uh, most of the component, the short name for the input and output is just basically one capital uh, le letter. This is the English um, uh, description. So when the user hover the mouse over the part, they will see a little tune tip and the tune tip will display that uh, message that explain what the input part is supposed to take into. The final thing, uh, well, the next thing is um, a special value. Um, this thing can only only be either GM param access item list or tree. You know, so if you use Grasshopper, some some input port only accept a, a single item. Some uh, expect a list, and some expect expect a, a, a data tree. Uh, this one, it's just a number, so it's only a, a single item. So that's why we specify that the input port only accepts one item. And the final parameters to this whole big function here 
is the default value. So in case the u if the user does not plug any number into this input port, this component will automatically uh, use 0, 0 as a default value. Okay. So that is the first input port, and we're gonna do the same thing again for the second input port. This one's second number. You know, everything else is pretty much similar. Okay, so let me type this in with you. Uh, we're gonna type in the first time so that we get used to it, but um, later, and uh, um, probably we can just copy and paste because this routine is quite simple. Um, P manager. Okay. And now, the first time you type in the code, you're going to appreciate how much better Visual Studio is at autocomplete and you know writing experience compared to the horrible code editor in Grasshopper. So if you say dot, um, you will have a proper autocomplete. So add number parameter. Okay. In fact, I don't um, recommend you to type out a full name. Rely on autocomplete as much as possible to avoid mistyping. Okay. And in Visual Studio, when you open the bracket, you will see that it automatically closes the bracket for you auto automatically and move the cursor right in the middle. So, kind of nice. Okay. And I will just put in an se extra semicolon here <laughs> so that I don't forget <laughs> because it will end with an extra semicolon. Okay, so now the five parameters that we have to throw in. The first is the full name of this input part. So, first number. Okay. Second number, oh, sorry, uh, this is called just uh, first. Uh, and then uh, the first number, okay, that's the English, uh, that's the, like the full the descriptions. Next one gonna be GM param access, okay, again, rely on autocomplete, dot item, final value is 0 0.0. .0. And the next input part gonna be identical, or almost identical. So I just copy and paste and change the text description to the from first to second. Um. Now, in case. Um, Okay, after you're done, let me um, show you how to turn on a few useful options in Visual Studio. The first is um, the line number. It's kind of useful to have. If it's not already on by default, you can turn on the line number by go to Tunes, Options. Okay, and let me see if I can remember this, <laughs> where it is. So, Tune Options. Uh, damn it. Uh, not this one. Uh, general. Or maybe we can just search for line number. Let's see if it can actually pop up. Okay. Damn, where where is that option? Text editor general or language. Oh yes, okay. Thank <laughs> so two options. Go to text editor, expand it, go to all languages, okay? Click on all languages and you should see line number. On the right, okay, turn, turn, and then turn it on. And for those of you who want to display the empty space at dot, so that you can distinguish between an, a real empty space character and just an empty space, you know, because there's no character, um, if you want to have that feature, um, I think that that one is not in the options. That one is, you have to go to view. And uh, damn it again, I can't remember exactly what it is. There is um, view. Okay. Uh, damn it. Okay, I have to look it up on Google later. <laughs> I have done it a long time ago and I can't remember. 
uh, well, it's not impo that important. It's just like a display feature to make sure um, that you don't, you know, you because sometimes some, many people like me obsessed with like distinction between like um, space character and like real, real um, the real lack of character. So, all right. So that is the two input parameters. What about the output? Well, the output's gonna be similar. So p manager dot add number parameters. Okay. So it's an output part. Output gonna be average. Okay, the short name gonna be average as well. Um, the description gonna be average of the two inputs. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So uh, Fred finally figured out how to. <laughs> okay, so if you want to display the empty space at dot, you go to edit, advanced, and view white spaces. Okay, let's carry on with the, the line of code that we're almost finishing. So add number parameter, average, average, average of two inputs. The last, the next thing is the uh, param access, which is just a single item. Okay, the output, of course, doesn't have any default uh, output value. So, you know, there's only four parameters. The default uh, value for the input is optional. So if you don't want to have an in default input value, you just leave this thing empty. And if the user doesn't plug in anything, the component will stay orange with a warning say that um, no no input has been supplied. Okay. So after you've uh, done this, and um, if you don't see any error, and normally if you uh, as you type the code, um, type the code, Visual Studio will try to detect error as much as it can, and under score and draw a little wiki wavy line, a red wavy line under the part where it thinks that there's an error. If you don't see any, like, if for example, if I, let's say if I mistype this one, okay, it's it pawned to me right away and say there's an error here. So it's kind of useful. And uh, it may even suggest a fix. So uh, let's see. Uh, if you click on that, you see a little light bulb here. Uh, it say uh, change add number to add number parameter. Yeah, it kind of tries to look up the closest name, and you know, uh, so it's a very nice code editor. Okay, so if there's no error, let's build and make sure that the build is like say succeed and one file copy, and then we can go back to Grasshopper, reload the uh, plugin, and now our component should have like two input and one output, even though it still hasn't done do, uh, do anything useful yet. It just like show the input and output. So build, go back. Okay, we're almost there. We almost finished our first ever useful plugin for Grasshopper, okay? And then you can start published on Food for Rhino. <laughs> and charge people money. Okay, need any help? No. Okay, so right again, I'm gonna close this file so I can reload it next time. I think we can even make a plugin to automatically force close on a file. Otherwise, it's gonna be annoying. But that's uh, that's. But let's save it for another day. Um, okay, now the real meat. Okay, the solve instant function. This is where the load, the main logic takes place. And again, of course, the main logic, as I say, is just one line. Add the two numbers, divide by two. Okay, but you're gonna see before we even do that, we have to actually 
read in the data. So, so, so these two lines, so this line only declare the part, the existence of the parts, okay? But in when when the component is actually runs, when the user use it, then the self instance will actually read in or harvest the actual number that being sent in, okay? To and then use that to do the uh, average math, okay? So the code for the self instance. All right, self instance again. It acts the self instance function take in an input parameter called uh, da. We don't have to care where DA comes from. I mean, Grasshopper will pass in DA when it runs it. So we, as the program of this, of this plugin, we only need to know that, okay, uh, DA has been given to me, and now I just use DA. So DA is, is the little parameter where we, you can use to retrieve the actual input data from the part that you declare early on. Okay, so first I have to declare two C-sharp uh, variable of type double, okay? This will hold the actual value that sent in the from the input part okay so it's called a and b and i initialize these two variable okay just let me expand the code first and then we we can type the code in together it's very simple but you know um, um it's more important to understand it rather than to like copy and paste it uh, without understanding it okay so a and we give it a default value you can say 0, 0.0 there it doesn't matter because that value will be uh, override anyway so here, instead of giving it a specific 0, 0.0, I give it um, a special number, which is not a number. So you see, so uh, the, 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 in, in programming language, it's useful to have a special value to represent an, an invalid value, an invalid mathematical value. And uh, in C sharp, if you say double.nan, it's a special value that represents that this is not, this doesn't have any mathematical meaning, okay? Uh, so it's called double, not a number, or nan. So, um, but you can put in any value you want as long as it's, uh, uh, it can be accepted as a number because in the next two lines, that, that A and B will be, the value will be overwritten, overwritten with the real value that the grasshopper canvas uh, kind of send into this component. Okay, so now we're gonna use DA dot get data. So DA is our parameters here. So DA dot, and again, rely on autocomplete, you should get data. You open the bracket. So get data is a function that harvests the actual data from the input part. Now the first parameter of this function is is the index of the input part. Okay. So the first number uh, we declare two input part, right? So the index is going to be zero and one. So 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 the first input part that we call first number, that one the index is going to be zero. Okay. And the value will be stored inside the variable a. And okay, this we met yesterday, but I'm. Probably you would you, you can't remember now, so let me explain the ref keyword. When you pass in a parameter using the ref keyword, and the function happen to modify these parameters, then that modification will have a lasting effect even after the function has finished. And this is what we want. We want to send in a. The function will actually store the number inside a, and then after this line we can use a to do math. That's why we want the modification to have a lasting effect. Okay, that's why this function was designed to work with ref parameters. Okay. And that's why we say ref, okay? Um, and then DA, now we read in the second number. That, so we read in the data from the input part at index one, okay? And we're gonna start, when we're gonna pass in B as a reference, okay? Now as you type in the code, and when you open the bracket, uh, you will notice that Visual Studio, whenever you type a function to open a bracket, Visual Studio will display a tune tip that tell you, um, like, you know, the list of parameters and then even the meaning of each parameter. So it's kind of uh, very helpful. You don't have to even remember it. Um, uh, in fact, in Visual 2017, I think the tooltip itself is even like highlight in proper color uh, syntax highlighting. So it's quite easy to read. All right. So now after this two line, A and B will store the actual number and then we can, you know, do the real logic, which is basically just one line. Okay. Okay, and we start the result in average, and now we just need to send the value of average to the output part. Okay, so we use da dot set data. Okay, this will send to the output part zero. We have only one output, so the index of that output part is zero. Okay, and the value that we send out is the the, the number that start in the variable uh, average. Okay, so as simple as that. So right here, double a equal to double dot nan double b equal to double dot nan okay da dot get data bracket zero 
Does your autocomplete box looks different than, than mine? Okay, it looks the same. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so let's build and reload plugins and plug in some real number to test if the answer is correct. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations on your uh, first grasshopper <laughs> plugin. Uh, now the only thing that you need before you publish this GHA online is an icon, obviously. <laughs> but we're gonna do that actually uh, later today. Um, actually, we can kind of do it now. Um, okay, let me show you how to add an icon. Okay. Um, so, I have to jump over to um, um, the forward slides, um, 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 the future slide a little bit, but you can bear with me. Okay, first let's talk about it, the, just the design of the icon itself before even you add it to the uh, Visual Studio's um, um, code. So, the resolution for a grasshopper icon is always 24 by 24, okay? And importantly, the DPI setting. So when you do it in Photoshop or Illustrator, before you uh, like export it to uh, an actual pixel map, you have to change the DPI to 96 pixel per inch. If you use, usually by default, Photoshop set it at 72 because that's kind of the standard DPI on Windows operating system. If you set it 72, it will look very blurry. Okay, even though it's 24 by 24. Okay, I will show you where to change the setting in, in Photoshop. Uh, File format, save your icon as PNG or uh, SVG. Never save it at JPEG, okay? And the reason is because, first, JPEG does not support transparency background, okay? Most icons have transparency background, okay? So that's the first obvious reason. Second, JPEG was not designed to store, like, um, graphics. Uh, the JPEG was originally designed to actually store kind of photo taken by, you know, a digital camera, not um, graphic that you um, design with software. Um, JPEG uh, basically make the file smaller by compressing it, but in the process of compressing it, it will create this kind of ugly artifact. Now, in a, uh, in a photo taken by digital camera, the artifact is not visible anyway, but when you draw a little graphics of 24 and 24 and you make all of the color perf perfect, you know, you, you go in and you use tune to like color on pixel and make it so perfect and then you save it JPEG and then it ruins everything, okay? So JPEG's on never 
preserve the original color of the pixel 100%. There's always some like weird artifact, which is not a problem for, for photography, but like for, for graphic design, it is a problem. So, so but PNG or SVG, so SVG is more popular on the Mac uh, operating system, I think. Um, then, you know, it supports both transparency and it's guaranteed to preserve, you know, the color for each pixel perfectly, okay? So, never save your icons uh, in JPEG. It's kind of a big taboo in graphic design. Okay, if you like talk to your graphic design friend and say that I just say, well, uh, here's my icon, please look at it, and you send them a JPEG file, they will gonna look at you like an alien. Okay, so never do that. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's draw a simple um, icon, just a plus sign in uh, Photoshop. Um, you can also do it in pen if you don't happen to have uh, Photoshop. But I just I just wanted to um, turn on Photoshop to show you where to change where you can change the DPI uh, settings of your um, graphics file. So um, again, if you don't have um, if you want just to get a twenty four by twenty four, um, actually in the hands out, I also uh, have a folder called icons with like two pyramids icon in there. You can also use that uh, if you don't want to draw it yourself. Okay, so I will gonna create something uh, 24 by 24, and the resolutions, which is the DPI here, okay, I will set it to 96, okay. Also transparent. Yeah, transparent. We're gonna delete it. Oh yeah, you can delete the background later on, okay. So. Um, I, I think I can't remember how to delete this background. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. And then I would draw. Okay, it's 24 by 24. So when you zoom it, it's actually a very crude. So I can draw a little uh, plus symbol here, maybe. Okay. Uh, let's make it orange so it really stand out um, for testing. If you're really obsessed with uh, graphic design, I mean, David Rutten even published um, icon design guideline where he specify like how much the drop shadows uh, blurring radius should be. So if you want to have drop shadows and you know the border or like what is the the, the margin between the border and, and the uh, the first pixel that you turn on in in your uh, um, in, in 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 your icon, um, like David Rutten has um, this kind of uh, guideline for you as well to make your icon look consistent with like uh, other icons in in in, in the plugins. All right, um, so it's transparent, so let's save this. Um, you can save anywhere. It will be later copied to the Visual Studio, direct, um, um, uh, Visual, the Visual Studio project anyway. So let's save it anywhere outside of the Visual Studio solution. And again, choose PNG. I would say average icons, okay? Av because it's going to go to the average component. Average icon. Okay, remember where you save the file because we're gonna go to Visual Studio and add that file from Visual for Visual Studio, and that file will be go into the resource um, the resources folder of Visual Studio. Okay, so go back to Visual Studio. Okay, and now go to properties. Go to our project, go to properties, and go to resources. Okay. Currently, uh, this project doesn't have any resource um, um, uh, file or manager at all. So let's create an, um, a default resource file, and then we will add the icon to this file. Okay. So click resource, uh, and again, it will be empty. So there's a little a link in the middle, and say that create a new resource file. Let's click on that, and it will basically create this file for you, which is a resource manager. Now, actually, the resource manager is actually a bunch of C# -sharp code running in the background. But the nice thing with Visual Studio, it's called Visual for a reason because many of the feature has 
kind of a nice visual presentation. So rather than adding a resource by writing C sharp code, you do it with you know just your mouse and your keyboard. And this thing will automatically generate the C-sharp code in the background. So just in case you're wondering, okay, the code for all of the resource is actually here. It's a C-sharp file, but you will never have to edit this file manually, okay? You edit it visually using, like, using this nice kind of uh, tool here. Okay, so resource, uh, we will add a new resource, add new, no, add existing file, okay? You can actually draw an icon inside Visual Studio too. It has a pretty simple kind of um, graphics uh, text uh, graphics editor inside Visual Studio. Uh, add existing file, okay, and then you just um, point it to the icon PNG. Okay, it will go in here. All right, so when you add a resource to the, your project, this resource will be represented by a C sharp variable. So whenever your code asks you to give it a resource, you can just give the name of the variable. Now the name of the variable is the same name as the file name average icon, but it's located in a, in a, in a special uh, namespace. So okay, we, let's, let's go back to our uh, GSC average uh, source code file. And if you scroll out a little bit, there is a little part where you can declare or define the icon for this component, okay? And um, David Rutten, I mean, the author of Grasshopper, uh, he also like put in a little hint for you here. Uh, so we're gonna return, so noon means nothing, so for now that's why the icon is empty, but now for the icon you say resources. Oh, that's not even the right one. Where, where is that resource name space? Properties, I think. Uh, just hang on a second. I have to find out the right path to that um, variable. So I think it's properties dot resources and then dot average icon. Okay, so that's a C sharp variable that points to the graphics, the bitmap object uh, that represents our, uh, our icon. Okay. All right, and now let build and test the result. Okay, you can see a little icon popping up here. <laughs> yep. Just this extra line, yep. Okay, let me show you an extra step. So in Grasshopper, mm -hmm. its component has an icon, but the entire mm -hmm. plugin also has its own icon, all right? So, but usually um, most plugin developers don't even bother making an icon for the, for the plugin. Uh, okay, so how do you know the icon for the plugin? If you go to help about, okay? Uh, you will see this little um, panel here, and you look at the upper left corner. There's a tiny, uh, a tiny black spot. If you click on a tiny black spot there, <laughs> it will list out all of the plugins that have been installed. And most of these doesn't have an icon, so it just uses the default icon. Okay. Now, if you want to specify a custom icon for your plugin, now I'm not sure which one is ours. It's called Workshop, right? Uh, Monolith. So Monolith is also like a pretty. Uh, uh, well, no plug in there, and they don't even have an icon. Uh, okay. Um, lunchbox or oh, lunchbox doesn't e also doesn't have icon either. Okay, this is our. Okay, our also doesn't have icon. Okay, so if you want to specify that, okay, this is where you can do that. And let's say that we're gonna use the same icon, otherwise, uh, because we don't have time to draw another one. So let's use the same icon that we have import. So this time you go open the C sharp file called workshop info. So this is where all of the basic info um, about your plugin is declared. 
Okay. If you open this, this is where you declare like the name of your plugin and the uh, description, the author, uh, contact information detail. These are the information that will be displayed in the main Grasshopper user interface. Okay. Now, if you scroll down, there is an icon field. Okay. And current icon is noon, but let's replace the noon with again the same the same uh, C sharp variable. So it's going to be properties dot resource dot. Okay. We're going to use the same icon here. Right. Okay, now you should see your icon popping up here. This panel, yeah, help, about, and the secret little black spot at the corner. Okay. If you double click on our plugin, double click on the icon, it will list information like the name, the icon, and what components that it uh, that it store inside. Okay. Okay. Oh, then you have to hover the mouse over to find it, to find the one that you're looking for. You double click on that; it will open information about a plugin. Okay, let's see. Maybe let's put it in there, but there's no icon, so you have to find. Okay, we're back. <sighs> okay, I just took a double shot at special, so if I start um, trembling and saying something funny, um, just please, please forgive me. <laughs> Just finish uh, the uh, average components. Okay, so we just make the components and that compute the average of two numbers, and then we uh, um, we we did a little icon for them. Okay, so um, there's one more thing I want to specify. This is not absolutely crucial, um, but when you write an actual plugin, it's nice to have this extra uh, mechanism in case the user plug in the wrong kind of data. For example, if um, this the average component expects two numbers, and somehow the user plugs in, okay, if the user plugs in a, a circle, then you know, Grasshopper will try. It's best to convert the circle to a number. It's actually, it's kind of kind of weird, but you know, uh, Grasshopper try to convert data as much as possible. So if you plug, if you ask for a number, and you plug in, let's say, a circle. I think it will use the radius of the circle and, and interpret that as the input number, for example. But if you plug in, let's say, a mesh or a text, and it cannot uh, convert, then it will just give you an error message. Okay, but anyway, you can even do better than that. So, for example, you can manually check whether the data has been written in correctly and display, and you know, either do some different logic or react differently, or just output a custom error message uh, complaining to the user or like hint to, to the user uh, what he should uh, be doing. Okay, so uh, if you look at the solve instance of the average uh, component. The da dot get data uh, is a function that okay takes the input index and the um, you know the the, the reference par, um, variable to store the output data, 
Now, um, yesterday I explained uh, this. This is a function, right? So it does return something as the main return slot. But but here you see that it's actually returned using the ref keyword. So it, it used the parameter as a as a as a vehicle to return the value. Why is that? Because the main return value is a boolean that tell you whether the get data fun uh, function has successfully collects the data. So with the Visual Studio, if I go in here and if you hover the mouse over the get data function, um, it will show you the full format of the function. So the function, if you look at it, it's return a boolean. So boolean and then the function name. Okay, before the function name, there's like this little green part. Okay, don't worry about that. That green part is just the, 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 the full path. Uh, of the class that contains that function. So but the function is get data, the return type is boolean, and then the input parameters at the end. So um, this function, it actually return a boolean value, either true or false. If it's true, true means that this function has successfully uh, collected the data. If it's false, then something has gone wrong. And by looking at the true false value, we can decide how to react. If it's true, then we go ahead and you know add the numbers together. If it's false, we can output an error message or you know uh, play uh, like uh, annoying sounds to attract attention or whatever okay uh, so how do we do that um, so we st so this is the code we have so far now remember this is this star of this return of value except that we don't save this value anywhere or don't use it because what we're interested in this case is the value star in a and b right but you know we can modify the code a little bit. Okay. Um, just please bear with me. I'm gonna fix this a little bit. Okay. Checks for input uh, validity. Okay. This is the code we have. Um, now we can store the return value, which is the true or false value, uh, in a variable called success one, success two. Okay. And we only go ahead and do the average if both success one and success true are both true. Okay, if one of them is false, which means that um, there's something wrong when uh, when the get data functions uh, try to perform its job. And if we go on and try to add those two numbers together, we might like crash the component. So we can put in a safeguard. Okay, so if success one and success two is true, you go on do the normal thing like add them up together and output the data. Else, you can you know, react differently. So in this case, we're gonna add a runtime message. So this function is a pre-built function. So whenever you uh, write code inside a custom component, you have access to this function called add runtime message. And it will basically output a message in the red uh, balloon or, or, or like bubble uh, at the corner of the component when, when it's red, okay? So so this function will take in two parameters. The first one, we, we specify how serious the problem is. So if you say gh runtime message level dot error, the component will turn red when this thing executes. If you say warning, it just then it would just be or, or, or orange, okay? And then this is the actual English message that will be uh, displayed. Uh, of course, here I don't have any better thing to say, so I just like uh, swear the user kind of. But you might be more helpful and say uh, check. You might check success one and successful. Uh, success two, like independently and specify. Uh, if success one is false, you output a message. Say please check input one. Uh, please input a valid number, for example. Okay. So anyway, let's try this one. Uh, I will copy and paste this in because I think it's like fairly straight, uh, straightforward. So the entire body of the solve instant function, I will just copy and paste it in. Okay, and now if you run this thing and try to plug in a piece of text rather than a number, or try to plug in a mesh or a curve, I think a curve is fine. I think, I think if you plug in a curve into a number input part, uh, Grasshopper will take the length of the curve and interpret that as a number anyway. So, so let's try to put in something illegal and see the uh, error message coming out. Sphere doesn't do anything, so let's do. Okay, I plug I 
plug in a piece of text here, and it's, uh, you can see it's compliant with the message we uh, put. Oh, it doesn't even reach that point yet. So, okay, something has been changed in Grasshopper 6. Okay, you might get error message in Rhino 5 because um, so something has been updated in Grasshopper 6. It, it, it's going to behave differently now. As you can see, Grasshopper really tried to convert uh, the data to the correct way. So if you plug in a mesh, it will try to convert it to a number. I'm not sure like how it does it, but you get a number in the end. Uh, so, but if you put in a text, so at least in Rhino 5, um, this text will trigger that error message to be shown. But this one is it's not that error message. Uh, it, it's a different one. So something has been changed in, uh, in, in Grasshopper for Rhino 6 for sure. Hmm. Okay, you text, yeah. And I get my error message, and then I get another error message. It also says that okay. the conversion failed. So yeah, okay, true. You, you have you have two errors. Are you using Rhino five, right? Uh, six. No, six. Six. Okay, six. that's weird. I just put in a panel with random text. Oh, okay. The reason why I didn't get error because I haven't reloaded <laughs> my okay. uh, GHA file yet. Okay. So, so you should get an error message. Okay. I keep forgetting to reload it. Okay, and now if you plug in. Text, you should get a complaint saying that you are an idiot. Yeah, okay, check the input you idiot. Okay. All right. That is not how to make a plugin uh, error message, by the way. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So that's part is kind of just a minor point I want to make. Um, from now on, I will not even bother checking for that like a Boolean value. I just assume that the, uh, the, the data coming in is like always valid and nice and uh, well behaved, okay? So, so far we have read in data as a single item, okay? But now we want to read in the data and output data list as a list, okay? We kind of, um, we already done this similar thing in a C -sharp script component yesterday. Now we're gonna do the same thing inside a, a, a Grasshopper, um, our own custom Grasshopper plugin. Um, so input output as list. Now we're going to make a component. This can potentially be actually a useful component uh, because um, there's no built-in component that, that do this thing. So this component that's taking a bunch of points and compute the centroid or the average of these points. Okay, um, It's kind of a useful routine um, uh, that, uh, that, that we can do. Um, and so, so the output, the input is going to be a list of points. The output is the single point, which is centroid, and a list of numbers. And then the, the, these numbers are basically the distance from the centroid to each of the points in the input list. Okay. So this example will show you how to do both input as list and output as list. Okay. So let's create a new crossover component. C sharp or Scott file inside our, uh, our, our, our plugin project. So right click on workshop, okay, add new item. Again, choose the template empty grasshopper component. And this one, we call it GHC, capital G, so GHC centroid, okay, remember capital C. Okay, uh, the name is just going to be basic, just centroid, 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 but again, please put it in the category workshop, okay?
Okay, and now we can declare the input and output parameters. So it's similar to what we did before. So this time we say p manager dot add point parameter. Previously we use add number, but this time we read in points data, right? So we say dot add point parameter. Uh, the name, the short name, and the description. Okay, so, but the access type gonna be dot list now, not dot item anymore. Okay. Okay, and then for the output, the first output is just a single point, so so it's it's an item output, but then we have a list of distances from the central to each of the input points. So this one gonna be a list of number. Okay, so add number parameters and the access type is list. Okay. All right, so that part is easy, uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, now in the solve instance, this is where we're going to actually read in the points, add them up using a for loop, uh, because we're going to read them out in a list and then we're going to use a for loop to visit each of the point, you know, and then accumulate it to a, a total uh, uh, sum variable. All right, so the main part. So we uh, have to create a list of point 3D. It will be empty at first, and then we will give this list of, list of point to the da.get uh, data functions. And the get data will fill in the list of points with the actual data. Okay, so here I'm using the name naming convention that I have this yesterday. So whenever I create a C sharp variable that is supposed to store the input of a component, I prefix it with I so that I kind of a way to remind myself whenever I see that variable. So I know that it's actually store data coming from outside of the components. Okay. Okay, and then we uh, we say da dot get data list. Okay, so previously when we read in one single item, we say dot get data. This time we say got get data list. And the first one is there's two there's two version uh, of this function. The first one we take in an integer that specify the index of the part. Okay, if you don't want to specify the input using the index number because it can feel a little bit intuitive, uh, counterintuitive, you can specify using the name, the full name that you declare. Okay, so this input part we previously declared at points, so you can like type it here, and then the get data list will try to look for any input part that match that name. Okay, the second parameter is the list here. Okay, and after this function finished, um, I points, the list I points will be populated with the actual point data coming into the components. Okay, and then we can. Uh, add up all of the coordinate of the points, okay, and then divide. So, so, if you have a set of points and you want to compute the central, you just simply add them up together, add the x, y, z coordinate, and then divide each of the x, y, z by the total number of points. So, it's just an average, okay. How you compute an average of um, a list of items, uh, okay. So, for those of you who uh, have um, took the Python course, um, this should feel very familiar to you. But if you have never seen this uh, pattern of programming before, uh, so this is called this kind of simple pattern of, of programming is called the accumulation pattern or ag aggregations where you have a list and you want to somehow combine them into one single uh, thing. In this case, we just want to sum them up into one single x y z value rather than having a hundred x y z value lying around. So first, we're gonna create the centroid thing. Uh, so this is this is the, the um, um, 
this 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 is a, a variable that we store the um, the the x y z coordinate of the entire thing, and then later if we divide that by the number of points, then it will actually be the coordinate of the centroid, right? So we create an um, a, a, a point three D whose coordinate is zero zero zero. Okay, so there's nothing to begin with, just the x y z value is zero zero. Now we have a for loop that visit each point in the list of input points. Okay. And then we're gonna add the point to the centroid, okay? So every time the for loop run, it take in the next point and add x, y, z coordinate to this centroid. So by the time the for loop finish, you will have the total sum of all the x, y, z coordinate of all the point being added together. So they just add and be accumulate into the centroid. And then finally, you divide the centroid by, you know, divide equal uh, means that um, again this syntax uh, if this syntax uh, is equivalent to say centroid equal to itself divided by by the number of points, okay? Because you want to take the average, that's why you have to divide by the number of points, okay? So divide equal is just a shorthand notation for something, you know, uh, div uh, uh, divide by itself, um, uh, uh, divide something into itself. Okay, so this is now the real centroid, and then we can um, output the central, which is just a point three D, into the data. Okay, so let let let's stop at this point, and you know we, we just like write a code at this point, and then uh, test our component to see if we get the central. Okay, and then we will go on and do the distance uh, later. Okay, so this point three D, I point equal to new list point three D. Okay, d a dot get data list points. Uh, if you don't want again, if you don't want to say point, you can say zero, which is uh, give you the same input part anyway. Um, Okay, um, if you've done like a uh, test it and um, input in a few points and you should see a centroid, uh, a centroid popping out and as you change the input point, you see the centroid will also uh, be updated live.
if you make sure that the category is workshop, it should appear in the workshop, but there's no icon, so it's a, we haven't declared icon for this particular component. So. Okay, I'm going to quickly test this. Okay, so I hope you get on the central working. Okay, let's go back to Visual Studio and then we're gonna compute the distances now. Okay, so we we have um, the distance gonna be the list of double, right? Um, so we have an empty list of distance first, okay, and then we're gonna visit each point, okay. We're gonna compute the distance between the point and the centroid, or the centroid dot distance to the point three D, which will give us a number, and we add this number into the list of distances. So, well, you can do it in two lines, but here I just condense those two lines into one because they are kind of fairly short. And then we have to output the result. Okay, so distances will be empty. The for loop will fill in the data, and then finally, da dot set data list. Okay distances, uh, which is the name of the output part, and then finally, the, the actual output data. Uh, now it's a different. So the first loop compute the centroid, and after you get the centroid, you have to initiate another loop. Yeah. So let's move on to the next uh, example. So now you know how to read in um, data as um, list. Uh, next thing, that's kind of very useful. And we're gonna use this uh, in, in um, this same technique uh, later when we uh, do the mesh growth system. So um, remember yesterday when we do persistent da data, when we have a uh, like a pond 3D that kind of live inside the memory of a component, and even if the component has finished running that particular run, the position of the pond still live inside the memory. So the next time you run it, you just retrieve that particular position and keep adding new stuff to it and just keep moving forward, okay? Now, um, we can do the same thing. Um, here, but um, it's gonna be uh, just slightly different. And this this kind of having a persistent memory or persistent data is, kind of, um, is uh, quite common when you make a grasshopper plugin, okay? So this is just a simple example where we have a particle that move. Uh, so the current position of the particle, um, at first will be set at 0 upon 0, but whenever the component run, it will move by a fixed amount or by, by a velocity vector, okay? So how do we do that? Okay, so let's create a new Grasshopper uh, custom component. Now you know how to do it, so, uh, and then specify this name. Okay, so, now component workshop dot add, new item. 
GSC moving particle don't forget to put this component in the category workshop Okay, the, the, the input to this component is, uh, again, whenever we want to do like persistent data, there's always a reset button, right? So the first input is going to be a Boolean, okay, uh, called reset, okay? And the second one is a vector that specifies how much the points should move each time the component runs. And the output is just the current position of the point, so the output is just a uh, point parameter. Okay, so now so far we have been writing all of the logic in a solve instance, and inside the solve instance we can declare a variable, right? Now solve instance is a function, so which means if you declare a variable inside solve instance, it will be destroyed once solve instance has finished uh, running. So in order to make a variable kind of lives on even after solve instance has finished, you have to declare it outside of solve instance. Similar to how we um, did it in the C script component, we have to declare that uh, a persistent uh, variable like outside of the main run script uh, scope. So we can declare it normally here, but by conventions, um, if you write a class, uh, again, I haven't explained what a class is in, in, uh, in C, -sharp, but um, the convention is that. Um, when you define a class, you should define a variable. You should put the variable definition uh, before the uh, function definitions. Okay, so maybe you can put it here because kind of close to the solve instance functions. Uh, but by convention, you should put it here. But it doesn't matter really. All right, so I gotta put it here just be uh, above the solve instance, so it's close to the code. Okay. So upon 3D, this will be current position. I think I call it, uh, yeah, I call it current position, I believe, yeah. So current position, okay. All right, so in the main part, we're gonna, again, read in the reset button. If reset is true, we're gonna s s assign current position to zero, 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 okay? Otherwise, we just add the velocity, the velocity that we read in here, and add it to the current position, and then we just output the whatever current position is to the output part particle, okay? So, bool i reset, so that is the value that we're gonna use to store the, the, um, the value of the reset input part. We just give it a initial value false, but we're gonna read it in later anyway, so we're gonna da dot get data to get it from the reset part we start in ok 
Hej. Okay, and then you check if reset is true. So if the user actually set reset to true, then we we set current position current position equal to uh, to the origin zero zero zero. Okay, if it is not true, else, okay, we will say current position. Okay, at the velocity, but we haven't read in the velocity yet. So, okay, we have to read in the velocity. So we have more than one line of code here. So I need a curly bracket, the curly bracket. Okay, uh, before I do the current position dot at velocity, I have to do read in the velocity first. So vector 3D, I velocity equal to uh, to just a random value for now uh, vector free yeah just just uh, arbitrary initialization and then we can do da dot get data okay and finally we can add velocity to current positions. Can um, try to rely on autocomplete as much as possible, and you will see that you will type, uh, you will much, uh, you will make fewer mistakes, and you're gonna generate the code much faster. Normally, you just type the first three letters of the variable name, and then autocomplete will be able to like single out the the right name for you, which is the first three characters. Okay, we're almost done. Finally, just output the current position to the output part. So da dot set data. So DAE, this input here, it's just a um, little parameter that start uh, the um, some special function that we can use to get and set. And again, you don't have to worry where it comes from. You just know that you're going to get it from Grasshopper, and you just need to use it to get the data. Yeah. Okay, so now if you run this code, you should set up um, your script like this. Okay, so um, this is the component we make. Uh, put in the reset button, okay? Uh, put in a velocity vector and a timer, okay? So uh, each time the timer takes, the point will be moved according to the velocity vector. Okay, make sure that you give a non-zero velocity vector, otherwise the point just like stay in the same place, okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's gonna be equivalent. I yeah, I structure is slightly different. I reset. Yeah, I put this part in the else. What is?
I misspell particle here. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think uh, I think we cover everything we want for the morning. So um, we can break for lunch now and get back at uh, two thirty. We will close it just like yesterday. Okay, we're gonna break for lunch uh, now, so we're gonna st I'm gonna stop the live stream and it will be back online in one and a half hour. Still the same link, okay? Still, still, still the same uh, video, uh, this, this, uh, uh, the same address, okay?